Welcome to CNBC.com. I'm Frank Holland, anchor of Worldwide Exchange, 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. weekdays. Earlier this week, Vertiv and Oaklo announced a collaboration agreement focused on the co-development of advanced power and thermal management solutions tailored specifically for hyperscale and co-location data centers powered by steam and electricity from Oaklo's advanced nuclear power plants. The pilot tech is planned for the initial Oaklo Aurora powerhouse. So to break down what all this means, I'm joined by Vertiv CEO Gio Arbertazzi and, and Oaklo CEO Jacob DeWitt. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Appreciate it. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Uh, Gio, I'm going to start with you. So Vertiv obviously focused on power yeah. and thermal management. Why work with a nuclear power provider and, and what makes this advanced, as you said in the release? I think a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, you know, awesome technology. Uh, Jake and the team have uh, developed. Uh, we all know that uh, power and power availability is crucial to the future of the data center industry. And we are a global leader in uh, power and thermal infrastructure for data center. So enabling the future of the data center industry is absolutely one of the central focus areas uh, for us. And certainly, um, small nuclear reactor and Jake will certainly uh, be able to elaborate so much more and better on the technology uh, are a very, very promising um, power opportunity for the for the industry. And uh, it's not just the power generation part, it is how the power generation, uh, small nuclear reactors and the data center infrastructure combine and scale to make the SMR technology available to the industry. And we believe that Vertiv, because of the experience, the unique domain knowledge, and the ability to scale is uniquely positioned to work in strong partnership together with the OCLO in making that future uh, happen really. All right, Jacob, I'm gonna ask you, uh, why partner with Vertiv? The demand for electricity, it's growing, it's on pace to out, outgrow supply significantly. Why do you feel like you need a partner uh, to get your energy, your steam electricity into data centers? I mean, won't the data centers come to you anyway? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think Jay was hitting on sort of the opportunity side with their leadership in the space as, as in many ways is what we see as the go-to provider for a number of different sort of solution sets for the data center industry, ranging from sort of the electric to the thermal management. I mean, they are the standard. Right. And for us, it was it was kind of just like a fantastic opportunity and a no brainer to want to work with them on this. Not only that, but they had a pretty strong interest and curiosity about being able to tap into some of the interesting things that, frankly, there's a lot of room to kind of pioneer new ways of doing things, leveraging some technology that's existed around, but integrating it in a more modern way to take our heat products and actually increase the overall net energy efficiency. So in other words, the amount of energy we actually produce in our reactor, more of it turns into usable energy that way for the data centers by combining the electric side of what we're doing, finding ways to better optimize that delivery of electricity from our, frankly, generators into the chips. And there's a huge amount of opportunity for what Verve has already done, but can do going forward to sort of co-optimize those pieces. And they sit at that really important part of the stack to, to enable this to be a pretty phenomenal solution for frankly, the hyperscalers and the folks who are thinking about how do we further increase just the net overall efficiency throughout the plant and reduce costs because you can reduce the amount of copper and have some different improvements along the path there. And then again, back to the energy side, we have heat we have to dump, right? Unfortunately, the laws of thermodynamics say we can only convert about one third of the actual energy we produce in our reactor into electricity. That means two thirds of that is generally speaking being dumped to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So if you can use and capture some of that heat and more and be able to use that to support cooling. I know that sounds funny, but use heat to cool. Um, but the heat's you know, basically a form of work you can use to drive cooling systems. You can improve the overall like energy usage across the plant. And that just further, frankly, extends the amount of energy we can provide and further reduces the overall net energy costs, which everyone is excited for. So it's overall a pretty significant improvement uh, upgrade. But integrating with Vertiv's you know, state-of-the-art kind of industry-leading cooling capabilities at sort of the chip level up back out to the data center side and then integrating that. It's a huge amount of opportunity and very excited to work on also actually developing that and piloting it um, at our first reactor in Idaho. All right, so Jacob, you mentioned a key word, cost. Uh, Gia, I want to come back to you. Earlier this week, we saw a capacity auction with PJM. 
that's leading many people to believe that the cost of power is going to increase, you know, rather significantly. As you continue to develop, will this power that we're talking about, is it going to be at the same level, just more available? Is it going to be cheaper? How is that going to work for your customers? Uh, I, I think it's a little bit early to say and look at the at the look at the numbers. I think Jake explained the trajectory, and it's a very very convincing trajectory. So it's not just the cost of uh, of uh, power and the power generated. Uh, it's not just the abundance of power that it can be uh, uh, generated through uh, small nuclear reaction uh, reactors, uh, but it's again reiterating what we heard is the ability to reuse the heat that is uh, that is generated. So the whole package of uh, power generation, uh, heat reuse, exactly along the lines of using the heat, certainly for, uh, uh, for the cooling of the data center, but there could be other uses over and above that. Um, the proximity of uh, power generation to the use and the load are all elements that make the equation from a uh, overall power cost, overall uh, PUE in uh, data center speak, um, all very compelling value propositions. And right. you know, uh, being part of this uh, of this uh, journey is uh, something that excites us uh, a lot. Jacob, come back over to you. Um, obviously, this is about data centers and kind of getting the power to power with this AI revolution. You were at the White House AI Summit earlier this week. Um, what were your big takeaways from the summit? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean, look, it's pretty clear that there's a massive amount of, <laughs> I would say prioritization and commitment um, from the government into this space um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's actually pretty wild to see is the efforts to really commit the U.S. to leading here, right? And I think what that translates to is looking at the all of the above equation set, everything from, you know, what it looks like to actually develop the data centers, but also to make sure we have the right things in hand to support that from an infrastructure perspective. So a lot of work to do, obviously, like a lot, um, but making it easier to build, making it easier to bring power online. We do face a pretty significant shortage of power uh, in, like, what is basically when you forecast out where things are going in this country, it's a massive shortage actually. And that's even on sort of benign levels of projected growth in the data center side. And I think those numbers, you know, might be quite soft. So just supporting reindustrialization and manufacturing, we have a shortage of energy. Then you add on electrification efforts and you add on data centers and AI, we just need a lot more power on the grid. And, you know, I would say maybe fortunately, but in some ways, unfortunately, um, the U S got kind of lucky. Uh, by not having to add a lot more capacity, by stretching a lot more out of our existing plants and assets for the last 30 to 40 years um, and not have to build a lot more sort of new generation in that last, in that sort of like intervening period, especially when you saw a lot of, frankly, of the industrial base offshore. That took a lot of the power demand with it, but now when it comes back, um, mm -hmm. you've got to keep up with it. And it's going to take a lot of modernization on the policy front to basically accelerate and enable more power to come online. But one of the ways that you can sort of accelerate that is by being innovative about how you bring that solution to customers. And that's one of the really great things about this opportunity and working with Vertive is the space to say, hey, what does it actually look like to kind of co-optimize um, building in, you know, a, a power plant either adjacent or co-located on the data with the data center side and take advantage of the similarities, the shared infrastructure capabilities, and more importantly, co-optimize how to actually deliver what you're making. You don't have to ship it out through the grid and, and generic fashion have it come back in. So there's some interesting things that come from that, not to mention the ability to use heat. Heat's a lot harder to ship than electricity over long distances, but when you're co-located on that, obviously you can also do things in a different way. Uh, and that is a pretty powerful enabler for just overall you know, efficiency improvement and, and overall cost reduction. Um, and I will say, I actually wasn't at the summit. I was around the summit. We had a board member okay, at the summit. Uh, I was doing the meetings slinking on the edges, but I got all the live time updates. Uh, it, but that, that was a pretty clear feedback point I had from folks around and in it. 
All right, fair enough. I mean, on the sidelines, but still right there in the action. G, I want to come back over yeah, to you. Yeah. Um, he was referencing some of the, uh, you know, the uh, CapEx spend that's expected to come from that tax and spending bill that recently passed Congress. Can you kind of give us a, a state of affairs on what you're seeing when it comes to infrastructure build out around AI and the CapEx spending that you're seeing? We got Alphabet results where they're increasing their CapEx by $10 billion, uh, well over right. what people estimated they were going to see. Just six months ago after DeepSeek, there was a lot of thought that maybe we don't need as much infrastructure. Maybe it's not as necessary. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think those uh, days and that thought process is gone and proven that uh, it was uh, probably a little bit of a premature conclusion on something that indeed accelerated quite significantly the appetite for inference in an industry. All good things. Inference is uh, using AI to serve uh, the industry, the business, the public, the individuals, and certainly to monetize uh, AI. We have seen uh, since then a lot, a lot of uh, focus on uh, uh, CapEx, uh, CapEx expansion, uh, development in the industry. We are bullish about the trajectory in which the data center industry is uh, is going and we have been uh, so um, for uh, for quite some time so we continue to be very optimistic and what we see example uh, uh, what what you just uh, mentioned is yet again um, in in that direction so uh, we believe that the the, the demand is a strong and is there uh, to last and uh, and again I go back to what we were saying at the beginning Certainly, uh, power is a constraint, but it's very encouraging to see a lot of uh, capital and a lot of ingenuity being being um, um, you know at play here to 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 address uh, to address the the, the the problem of power availability, mm -hmm. and we are extremely extremely excited about uh, again what we're doing with the uh, Oklo here, and um, as Jake was saying, uh, it's it it is about making sure that we have not just the modularity in uh, in the, let's say, SMR level, but making sure that whatever we do is done through reference architectures in power, in thermal, that are super efficient and can be deployed at scale. Scale matters dramatically in the data center industry, exactly for the reasons, uh, Frank, you were mentioning, CapEx, is continuing okay. to flow in this uh, in this space. So Gio, I just want to pull in this thread for a second. Can you just give us your, your outlook for the back half of the year? Um, what are you expecting to see when it comes to the uh, infrastructure space and as far as the demands from other companies, whether it be other hyperscalers like a Microsoft or Amazon or just other, other companies out there? Um, are you expecting to see a big acceleration? Are you expecting to see just a change in the, in the strategy that companies are doing? What's your expectation? I would say that I go back to what we uh, said at our uh, earnings uh, call now, uh, April, and anyway, the, the the projection for the industry, we, we could just see um, it, in, an industry in the uh, data center space, especially hyperscale and collocation uh, uh, growing on 15, 17% um, year on year for what our market is concerned. So certainly, certainly a, a robust uh, landscape. I will not go into details of the first half, second half, uh, that, that a little bit too much of, uh, um, let's say, false accuracy, but what we see is encouraging. What's your outlook for the second half of the year? I mean, I think it's like a good said it. I mean, I think it's gonna be a pretty significant acceleration with respect to sort of you know, obviously you see increased capex from, from the major players in the space. You see that propelling forward and you see that, I think, having to go further upstream into enabling on the power side. Uh, and I think you're going to see that flow increasingly over in different ways. So I think you're going to see more activity in the space that scales there. I think everyone has been very focused on what they can do to get power in the next two years, which is going to be heavily based on generation that already exists or maybe potentially slightly like increased amounts, like marginal increased amounts of generation from existing assets. But when you look at the growth for new generation, that's where people are starting to turn their attention to, especially when they think about the long term scalability here. Uh, and I think you're seeing all of them, you know, have to look at that and plan like that, which means you're going to see, I think, a lot more activity that's going to be coming down the pike for 
looking at how they're going to be, you know, signing up deals, partnering with companies, doing work, providing power, like what we're doing, uh, and especially thinking about what that translates to for overall planning from, you know, actually building out assets and scaling those things accordingly in different areas in different ways. So it's a like pretty, um, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be kind of a, a second half of the year into the first half of next year that I think is going to be pretty, like there's going to be increasing activity in that side of things. And then I expect, you know, you're going to kind of see that ramp continue. Um, it's going to be interesting because there's a little bit of a lull from those things happening uh, until those new generation assets come online, but you're going to see the milestones of development going from, okay, signing the paper to actually breaking ground to, you know, installing equipment to then doing commissioning and turning the plants on. That's going to be a city drumbeat that cadence it out for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I think you're just going to see more and more sort of push to pull and accelerate those things. I also think there's going to be increasing coordination and push on the policy side to say, what can we do to further accelerate these things? What can we do to further deconstrain, especially on the new nuclear generation side, the, the things that are actually constraining near term sort of like ramp up rates that can be higher than what we, I think, have generally thought would be feasible before. What that looks like is, you know, accelerating on permitting is already happening. That's amazing. Uh, and, and one of the other big things falling out from the executive orders is acceler accelerating fuel availability. Um, and that's one of the interesting things in the US, we really fell behind, like we used to lead the world in nuclear fuel supply chain. And back in the 80s, we had more capabilities and capacity than the rest of the world combined. And now we've really let that lapse, but you're seeing that get reinvigorated. And I think as we see the hyperscalers get deeper into planning for their power needs, seeing, hey, there's ways they can help accelerate that development, but also take advantage of the opportunities the government's making available, but taking material the government has that they're just sitting on are gonna throw away, but can be used as fuel in reactors like ours. So things like excess materials left over from weapons programs, it's actually a pretty cool way to think about how you can actually repurpose things that uh, were otherwise gonna be a, a okay. waste form that can actually be used as fuel. Big upside from that. So I think you're seeing this whole stack kind of start to play out, uh, thinking about like how to go up and down the, the value chain, frankly. All right, gentlemen, we're going to leave the conversation there. Vertiv CEO, G.R. Bertazzi, Oklo CEO, Jacob DeWitt, thank you both for your time. Thank you all for watching CNBC.com. I'm Frank Holland, the anchor of Worldwide Exchange.